everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I am very excited today. I'm also very nervous. I don't know that there's ever been a moment more important for the open internet than we're experiencing in this time in 2023. And I also know that we shipped a product 23 months ago, which was our most successful product release ever in Solomar. Here we are 23 months later. The trade desk has more than doubled in size. I'm today trying to represent the work of over a thousand engineers and product people. And many of those products are extremely complicated and we just have so much to do and to talk about. Many of our engineers are here in the room. We also have some of our investors. We have many of our clients and we have people joining from all over the world. So I have to remember that for every one of you in this room, there's almost 10 of you outside somewhere else in the world watching this. So thank you so much for joining. I also have to say that this release is a bit more personal than many of those that we've done in the past for a couple of reasons. One, because I've been buying media for my family foundation, I've been in the platform, and so a lot of this is are things that I want. Uh, so I'm excited to talk about those. But also, we launched this company 15 years ago, and in that time, there are some things that we've been chasing and been trying to get right that I, I believe only now are we getting right. So this one is, is very deeply personal. So with that, we'll jump in because I have so much to talk about, so many things to share, so many new releases. So, so let's jump in. First, I think there are two ways to do business. One is to uh, approach it with a paradigm of how do I win? How does my company win? How do we, in some cases, hold clients hostage? Like I th in some ways, I think you can say that businesses either have customers and partners or they have hostages. And I would much rather look for win-wins. I would say that the way the Trade Desk has been successful is looking for partners where we both can win. So I just wanna be super clear that everything we're talking about today is looking for win-wins. We have to partner with each other. I believe that's the only way the open internet can win. And so a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is how we can do more together. And it's much more difficult for the open internet than it is for walled gardens, which we'll, we'll talk a bit about too. To be clear though, I don't believe that means everyone wins. There are lots of companies that have been on the Loom Escape, if you remember what that is. We don't reference that nearly as often as we used to. But there are lots of companies on the Loom Escape that uh, don't add as much value as they charge in fees or they're not trying to innovate and stay ahead of, of the way the market is evolving, but instead trying to capture it or trying to, uh, to hold on to a business model that won't survive the future. And those shouldn't survive. Uh, but there are many that are trying to evolve. There are many that are trying to make the internet better. And to those, we want to partner with you. And we're going to spend some time talking about that today. It is very rare that we have a market as big as ours that is as immature as ours is. We were talking about supply chains the other day. There's no other business or sector in the world where instead of like a, a product coming from China and having seven stops along the way before it gets uh, uh, to the United States, where it goes around the world nine times and maybe goes back to China six times. That's essentially what we do in the supply chain of our industry. There is so much opportunity for us to make that better. In Kokai, there is an opportunity for us to work together. So let's talk about what that is. I do believe part of the reason why I feel pressure today, why it's, it's an important moment, is because the open internet can still fail. If we don't work together, if we don't get it right, the open internet can fail. It can be a world with just a few big companies, a few big walled gardens that doesn't have the competition and the healthy, vibrant economy that we all want. So there's a lot for us to do. But what we have to do on the open internet is we have to create a supply chain that is relatively competitive. So I mean, when you compare it or contrast it to walled gardens, it has to be competitive. That is much harder for all of us to do because we don't control the ecosystem end to end. In a walled garden, by its very definition, you control from advertiser to publisher, you call all the shots, you write all the code, you make all the rules, like one way to define a walled garden is that you're big enough to be draconian. None of us in the open internet are big enough to be draconian and be successful. So it means that we have to work together. But it doesn't mean that we can't watch and learn from the things that walled gardens have done well. A couple of things I just want to point out. One, 
I think the amazing genius of Apple's business, I actually think the most valuable part of Apple is its app marketplace, which is a very open internet-like thing, right? Where it basically created on the, on the iPhone, in some ways almost inadvertently if you know the history of it, but with their iPhone 2, they went from instead of having 10 or 12 apps that Apple had developed themselves, at iPhone 2 they launched 500 apps that were almost all developed by other people that were really amazing to create this center of gravity. If you look at Facebook, uh, things to learn there, I don't know that there's a company ever in the history of advertising that has built better on-ramps, easier on-ramps for advertisers than at Facebook. You can part ways with your money in two minutes. You sign in, you give them your money, you give them the goals, and they'll spend. And that's genius, by the way. That, that's not a criticism. That's just a very different thing than what we're trying to develop at the trade desk and what I think most of us are trying to do in the open internet. But our ambition is a much more difficult thing to realize, too. And, and that's where kokai comes in. So first of all, kokai means open waters in Japanese. It's also slang for open for business. And so if you think of open waters, if you've ever been out on a boat in, in the ocean where you're looking out at the horizon and you see nothing but water, it can be daunting, it can feel freeing, you feel freedom, you also can feel overwhelmed, you can feel small. But for me, I think I see the most opportunity, I do feel that freedom. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can together create that sense uh, of freedom. We are not trying to develop something simple. What we have been trying to do is develop something that is as simple as possible without losing power. And so when I say our ambitions are much more difficult to realize, that's what I mean. We are trying to give our advertisers as much power and control as they can without overwhelming them with complexity. And that's the thing that is extremely difficult. Like every UI has this dilemma. You're trying to give people control, but if you give them too many what ifs, too many buttons and dials, you have to give a history lesson for four hours every time you train somebody on the UI. And so what we're constantly trying to do is reduce the complexity without ever losing the power. And how can we create as much power in the user interface and in the APIs as possible so that our buyers have as much power as they possibly can without being overwhelmed? We also have the burden of objectivity. That's a double-edged sword, though, in that if you have objectivity, I believe that is the only way, really, to bring down the walls of the walled gardens. And our objectivity is something that all of us have to, have to protect. There's a couple other concepts that I just want to highlight that I think are foundational to understanding the products that we're shipping today. One of them is expressiveness. Uh, so you might have heard us talk about this before. Some of you probably haven't. Let me explain what that is. So first of all, the dictionary definition of expressiveness is the quality of effectively conveying a thought or a feeling. But what we mean more specifically when we're talking about buying media is how well do you describe the various permutations that you're willing to make in order to buy specifically. So for instance, if somebody was on our website six minutes ago, how much more do I pay than if they were on the website 11 minutes ago or 23 hours ago? How much more do I pay for frequency cap number three versus frequency cap number four? If you're seven miles away from the store, how much more do I pay than if you're 14 miles away from the store? How do you create a, a way for you to express the value or the, the shape of the curve of each of those variables while not giving you the burden of knowing every sp specific little detail? Supporting that, those level of permutations is expressiveness and the number of permutations that any pr specific campaign supports is its expressiveness score. So you'll hear us talk more about that throughout the day because that's something that's really foundational to many of the things that we've shipped. So as I mentioned, the open internet has a burden that walled gardens don't. What we are also trying to pow power is another concept that I just wanted to lay foundationally for this discussion, which is decisioning. So you'll sometimes hear us talk a lot about that. Half of you in the room are like, uh, I've heard the trade desk talk about this 20 times, but there are some of you in this room that have not heard us talk about it, so I just want to be specific and clear about what it is. Decisioning is, is basically making a choice about what to buy or sell. And most media decisioning has historically been done by publishers because of the nature of media. 
So if you look at linear television, for instance, what would happen is you would give your money to the content owner, a television network usually, and then they would decide what spots you got. You didn't necessarily choose specific users, specific impressions. You gave your money and then it was attached to the show. What's happening today, because digital can do so much better in the sense that uh, you can customize every ad for every user, is that buyers, advertisers, are willing to pay more to have decisioning. So instead of giving that to the sell side, which sometimes the sell side will lower the price in order to retain it, but almost always it is worth it for the buy side to pay a bit more for the power of decisioning. And if you do pay more for the power of decisioning, you better take advantage of it. Uh, and so what is happening in our ecosystem is as more and more decisioning is moving to the buy side where we're willing to pay for it, and that's the only way that content can sustain itself. That's the only way that it can make enough money to pay for itself. The buy side has to justify that by increasing the efficacy. And the only way that we can do that is if we make the tools better. And that's what we're after today, and that's what we're going to talk about. In January, we launched a product called Galileo. I, I love this visual, by the way. It's just uh, kudos to our marketing team for putting this together because I think it finally conveys the concept that Galileo is, which is putting your first party data to work as an advertiser. The only way the open internet is going to be successful is if advertisers put their first party data to work. Only way. It's the only way to win against walled gardens. It's the only way to create enough competition uh, uh, because effectively, Inside of big technology companies, they have amazing data assets. Whether you're a search engine, a social network, whatever, they have amazing data assets. The only thing that trumps that, if that's the, the king of hearts, the only thing that is an ace above that is advertisers' data themselves. So meaning, what are my actual customers? And if you can take that and put that to work in various ways, that's the only way to win. So one of the things that we understand deeply at the trade desk is that the only way that we can win is if we build and maintain your trust around first party data so that you can put your data to work. Galileo was one of those things, one of those products where we made it easier than ever to launch or to use your first party data. Uh, and by the way, we launched that in January at CES. More than half of all the advertisers on our platform are using it in some capacity today. It's been one of the most successful products that we've launched, but there's still so much more that we can do. And in fact, we've updated the product in a variety of ways, which I'll talk about in just a second. I do want to talk about another concept, another foundational concept in order for us to have this discussion today uh, about the concept of seeds. So you're going to see this throughout our platform from this day forward, which is when you put something at the bottom of the funnel, which is conversion data, customer data, here are the 5,000 people that bought my product. You can mathematically go find them and look alike model and do all sorts of things to see that seed grow and go find others like it. So seeds are that really concentrated data that is insights about the people that have already bought your product. So if you think of those as seeds that can be planted and grow into something much bigger, it is critical that we learn how to harness the power of those seeds in order for, for us collectively as an open internet to be successful. So a, a couple ways where that comes into play, probably the oldest one, the simplest one that, that most people that have been in online advertising for any length of time understand is retargeting. It's powerful, but it is more of a one-to-one -one situation in the sense that if a thousand people got to your website but didn't actually buy your product, then you go message to them and say, hey, you forgot to buy the product, there's reasons to come back, and you remind them, nudge them to come back. But it's always a one-to-one -one scenario in the sense that if 1,000 people come to the website, you go and target a different 1,000. I believe in addition to objectivity and expressiveness and all the things we've talked about, there are a series of players that have to execute well in order for the open internet to thrive above walled gardens. Again, this is a comparative or, or relative race, if you will, where there are supply chains that they control end to end, and there are supply chains that the open internet has that are not controlled by any one person, but have to be sufficiently competitive and efficient in order for them to survive. The only way that we can create those adequately efficient and effective is with two groups executing really well. One is retail data, and the other one is CTV. 
as I was prepping for this, I, I presented these concepts, and somebody said, um, why? <laughs> so let me explain why this is, this is at least my theory. CTV is optimally fragmented. So if you look at the shape of the funnel, at the top of the funnel is almost all the surface area. This is the reason why so much money has been spent in brand. This is why the biggest advertisers in the world are creating brand affinity. That's the reason why it is so effective to advertise in television, because you move hearts and minds. I've even made the argument that search is not advertising, because it is not in the business of winning hearts and minds. It's very effective, I'm not negating that, but the, the process of making people aware of your product, winning hearts and minds, that's done much more up funnel. And CTV, because it represents so much uh, of the surface area of the funnel, and because it's perfectly fragmented. And what I mean by perfectly fragmented is, if it were like websites where there were millions of them, it would be hard to get everyone to work together. It would also be hard to get them all to be rational because we can't really sit down and explain why the SSP fees are lower at this small SSP to a tiny little website that's just like, I was just trying to write about sports. So when you are sufficiently concentrated, you have the ability for everybody to be rational and make deliberate strategic choices. You also want it to be fragmented enough that no one has the ability to be draconian. Because I mentioned before, one definition of walled gardens is that they're big enough to be draconian. No one has that luxury in CTV. It is sufficiently fragmented that no one can be draconian, but sufficiently aggregated that everyone is strategic and rational. And especially when you look at the cost of content and the way that they've all been competing with each other, it creates this perfect ecosystem to lead the open internet. Now, it has a dilemma, though, which is that because it's at the top of the funnel, it's not as easily measured as, for instance, search and social is which is much more bottom of the funnel. Whether you call it advertising or not, we can all agree it's near the bottom of the funnel. I already knew about the Verizon phone before I typed in buy Verizon phone. So you can argue advertising was done before then, but it, whether you call it advertising or not, that activity is much more lower funnel. So in order to, to justify this, in order to make sense of it, we need better measurement. We need to know that if we advertise up here, who bought it? Did it work? And if we can do that in a very concrete and tangible way, then we harness the power of objectivity, which is a euphemism for we harness the power of the open internet. And if we do that, then we can move dollars into the open internet because you can justify or defend its spend in a way that you never could in a walled garden because even if it's full of data, it is not full of objective data. So it's in there that we really can together uh, bring down the walls uh, of the walled gardens. And that's where retail data plays such a significant role. So to explain just more precisely exactly what that is, if you have a 1,000 conversions in a store, you can go upstream and connect to what are the 274 touches that that user had before they actually bought the product. And if you do that across all of the conversions in any given store, then you have a very clear sense of which of my ads are working and which are not, which has been the burden of advertising forever, which is you know, the adage, half my advertising is working, I just don't know which half. Well, we can actually solve that. And by the way, we have to in order to justify the higher costs of decisioning, which also justifies the higher cost of content, which is the only way that the CTV virtuous cycle is maintained. We can use the concept of look-alike modeling. And I know that half of you here understand it and half of you could use a refresher on what look-alike modeling is. But you experience look-alike modeling every single day. When you go to Amazon or any store like that, it says people who bought this product are also more likely to buy this product. A and this shows up all over the place, all over the internet, in everything you do. And one of the concepts that we talk about with our data science team all the time is that you can look alike model everything against everything. And so on every vector, let's see those that bought it are more likely to do this, or those that got the, to this position of the funnel, or those that did anything. By doing that, instead of the retargeting 1,000 to 1,000, we can actually create something much bigger than that. And this is why first party data and seeds are very important. So let's jump in to some of the things that we are going to talk about. So we want to take this 
data, make it much bigger than it is. We've been chasing relevance, seeds, expressiveness, and our platform going forward will be more audience-based buying. So this is a concept we talk about in our own four walls all the time. We need to be more audience-based in the paradigms that we represent in our UI. It doesn't mean that you won't be able to select inventory and you won't be able to have power and control over that as you always have, but there is so much more that we can be doing with first-party data and with audiences, and in fact, we have to in order to progress the open internet. So I want to be personal for just a minute because I mentioned that this release is a bit more personal but I also think it, it showcases the significance of where we're at right now. Some of you may know I really like photography. It is definitely one of my passions, and I also love spending time all over the world. And I mentioned to you that uh, Kokai is Japanese, so I wanted to share a couple of photographs that I've taken. Uh, I think one of the best photographs that I've ever taken is this one that I took in Kyoto. I was trying to go to a temple, and it started pouring rain. And everybody, even though most of us had umbrellas, took cover because it was raining so hard. And we're all just sitting there waiting for the rain to pass. And I was just starting to get a little frustrated. I'm, I get very antsy when I'm not doing anything. Like productivity is very important to me. And I wanna get every, every ounce out of every minute, uh, uh, especially when I'm on vacation, like experience as much as possible. So sitting there undercover, I see this woman walking up the hill by herself, just unfazed unlike the hundreds of us that had taken cover. And it just made me think, like, what am I doing? Like, why am I afraid of water, uh, a little bit of rain? And it inspired me to do what she was doing. She was not trying to be a leader. She just put her head down and tried to do her work, if you will. But all of us that then followed her were able to get to the temple sooner. We were able to experience something together. And in a way, it connected us more to experience that more difficult environment. I think that's exactly where we are right now. I don't know if the trade desk is her or someone else is, but I definitely feel this moment where we have to let the environment not phase us. We have to put our head down and remember where we're going because I do think that this is the moment that can change the open internet. In that context, I just wanna remind you and remind everybody, especially those joining us from around the world, the Trade Desk is not an American company. We are a global company that happens to be based in the United States. Uh, and and while we care about all these concepts of the open internet in the United States, we care just as much about creating change around the world. And in fact, we're so interconnected, uh, there is no way to change the American open internet alone. Either you change the open internet or you don't. And so we recognize that this is a global effort that we all have to be on. And that is why, despite the fact that 40% of our revenue doesn't come from outside the United States, about 40% of our employees do. And that is because we are investing ahead, recognizing that the battle to progress the open internet is a global one. So I'm excited to announce that uh, uh, Galileo today is upgraded. We've added 14 new data partners. We have seven new CDP cleanroom partners. We have uh, a ton of UX improvements around Galileo that makes it easier for you to leverage your first party data. So if you're not using it, there's a lot more reasons to use it today. If you have only been using it a little bit, there's a lot more reasons to use it even more. One thing that I just wanna be clear about as we open up our platform to welcome more integrations is it is not lost on us that every app marketplace or every marketplace where developers can develop to, whether Apple, who talked about theirs yesterday, or Salesforce, or the Google Play Store, every app marketplace has one of two problems. Either they have no one writing to it, and they're saying, please, develop to us. So either you have a problem that no one cares, or you have so much opportunity there that you are trying to fend off the crap, right? So I'm sure all of you have experienced this in the mobile marketplaces when you log in. I've, this happened to me in Apple not too long ago. Needed a PDF reader, going to get the PDF reader, a free PDF reader. You get it and then you open it up and it's like, it was free to download, but if you want to view PDFs, that's $29.95 a week. Uh, so uh, those are the situations that Apple is working like crazy to make certain don't happen. But when your marketplace is as vast as theirs, it's a very difficult task. We have the problem of the latter as well. 
So a big part of what we've been doing and what you'll see us continue to do for the, for the second half of this year is one, for our, for our closest partners to add value, we recognize, like in the Apple Marketplace, that those that have written to our, our app marketplace that are adding value, you're at the core of our company. You're at the core of our value proposition, just like at Apple. And we have to make it easier for you to iterate. We have to make it easier for you to, to receive price discovery for whatever you're selling, make it easier to make changes. And we've been working really hard to do that. And for those that don't add value, that are charging $29.95 a week for a PDF reader, we need to make certain that they never see the light of day in our platform or at least that they change their business model in order to see the light of day. So just know that we're doing that as well. Leading up to this, as we've been in the early phases of creating what I'm about to announce, we have done over 450 integrations in the last two quarters alone. So 52 in user data, 44 in inventory, meaning a media inventory, and over 350 platform API integrations, either new ones or massive upgrades to the ones that we already had. So as of today, the Trade Desk is an open collaboration hub where you can develop any of these types of products. I really look at these simplified as these six types of products. First is exemplified by Walmart, who's been a phenomenal partner. Many of you have used them. That is a custom offering. It is, by the way, much harder to integrate into our platform as a custom offering because it just takes a lot of, of, of meetings, a lot of engineering time because we're doing something Bespoke, We've, we're doing something that hasn't been done before. But then there are all these other companies. I'm very excited about the creative development, especially because there's more and more AI companies that are developing creatives using AI that I think can empower advertisers to have a lot more variety and iterate a lot more. So they can develop to our APIs. The media inventory companies like Pubmatic or inventory metadata. So what that is is you're describing the inventory, whether it's, in their case, describing news data as safe or unsafe, or whether you're describing inventory as being likely to be viewable, or, or it, any other metadata that can make uh, that actual inventory worth more or less. We've created standard adapters, standard APIs, so that people can write to it and enrich the value of inventory and enrich ex ex expressiveness across the platform. Of course, there's also user data, where more and more, this ecosystem is getting much healthier, and we're going to talk more about that. And then, as we were just talking about before with retail data, there's nothing more important to advancing the cause of the open internet than retail data. And I'm very excited to make some announcements about Walgreens and some other partners today. So today, we are launching our partner portal where we are open for business, Kokai. And there are so many uh, of you that I know we have not been always the easiest to integrate with. Uh, it, it has driven me crazy at times to meet with people and say, how are we doing as a partner? And they've said, well, we're waiting in the queue, and your team got back to us and said, next quarter. Just know that that has, has really sunk deep inside of, uh, of, of my soul, to be honest. I have taken that back to the team, and we have changed the way that we're, we're developing and supporting those partners. In fact, I see some of you here who I've had those conversations with, so I'm, I'm so excited uh, to welcome you to build to our platform in a more iterative and less friction way than ever before. I want to be really clear about, it, to both buy side and sell side, many of which are here or listening today, is that we are more insistent on creating an effective and clean and clear and honest supply chain than ever before. And that means that we want to buy inventory that has global placement ID on it. We want to buy inventory that properly labels in-stream versus outstream. We want to buy inventory that has a higher probability of viewability. If it doesn't, it's not effective. Uh, we want to make certain that we have UID2 so that we can layer data on top of it and make it worth the extra price we're paying for decisioning. And we want auctions that have integrity. One of the things that we have not always done well is that when people don't do those well or they falsify that, yeah, it's one thing to not buy it, but how do we make certain that they don't keep trying to do it? How do we penalize it sufficiently that the ecosystem gets better? And so that's something you're going to see us continue to wrestle with. But it, uh, my, my plea to all of you is to try to do the right thing, 
to try to make the ecosystem better. Again, this is a relative competition to walled gardens, and we all have to be better so that we can enable things like price discovery. In some cases, we haven't had the signal or the ability to consume the signal for the things that we need to in order to properly value inventory, and that is changing rapidly. That is changing rapidly in part because of OpenPath. So OpenPath just celebrated it, its first birthday. I am so excited about this product, by the way. I, I know there's been a lot written about it in the press. I've been surprised at uh, the sort of ruffling of feathers that this product has created. I will confess that there's some of that ruffling of feathers that I take great joy in. <laughs> but really what we're after here is to create a better supply path, to create a better open internet. We are not trying to be an SSP. We are not doing yield management. We are not creating conflict of interest. We are representing the buyer, always have, always will. But we are willing to tell publishers exactly what we're willing to pay in an effort to create a clean line or a baseline of, of how we're willing to spend to insist that especially in, in the sell side, people are adding more value than they're extracting. We launched this a year ago. In that time, we've integrated over 20 sellers that aggregate domains across the internet. You may recall that we focused on journalism. I will admit there were days that we were unsure if we made the right decision to focus first on journalism because it is not the place where they move the fastest. But it is the place, that, you know, it's one of those things where you fight the fights that need fighting. That is one of them that desperately need it. Journalism uh, has to change and evolve, and so I'm delighted that we started there. But in one year, we've doubled open path traffic every quarter. So in the, in the five quarters that we've been running, the quarter after was double what it was the quarter before. And we've added over 11,000 destinations, so sites, apps, and channels. So I am very excited about what this means for the future. Today, we're launching new products around open path, and those especially include products for the publishers. We are giving supply chain tr transparency and control so that you can block at the domain or the property level. We have an API for publishers to reject live creatives. One of the biggest reasons why uh, uh, auctions are rejected is we haven't, as an industry, had good mechanisms to talk to each other, and so the auctions have been somewhat inefficient. It's the worst when you're the highest bidder, you win, and then you don't get to show the ad because of a, a creative misalignment between the two entities. Uh, we also are creating competitive separation protocols and APIs. It's the first of its kind. So in CTV, this is especially important. So you don't want to put two COLA competitors right next to each other. They don't want that. The content owners don't want that. And so by creating APIs that make it possible uh, to have competitive creative separation, it makes it possible for everything to be more effective and us not waste auctions and wins and make our budgeting problems more difficult. And the same with dynamic potting. We already have seen double-digit decreases in losses as a result of these products in, in beta, so I'm very excited to launch those uh, uh, today. I'm also really excited to talk about the next steps for OpenPath. Over the next year, instead of doing 20 integrations, our plan is to do 100. That's not just focused on what we've done to date, which is mostly in US journalism. Right now, we have deals in the works in Japan, in Indonesia, in Korea, in New Zealand, in the UK, in Spain, and Germany. But maybe I'm most excited about the CTV deals that we have all over the world, including here in the United States. But even also with, with OEMs in, in television. And the significance of this cannot be overstated, in my view. And it's partly because of the shape of the internet. If you're looking at the way brand dollars are spent, it basically gets distributed about like this, where about half of the spend goes to the top 100 destinations, especially when you include connected television. If we do those 100 partnerships, I do believe we will dramatically change and improve uh, the open internet and the supply chains of the open internet. Again, this is not us trying to compete with SSPs. I, I, I feel like I have to just keep saying that. We want you to do well, well. We want you to do yield management for publishers. And I think we're helping to create that opportunity with this product. During the pandemic, I, I bought a collection of bonsai trees from a, a Japanese man near me that had passed away. By the way, they're almost as much of a burden as pets. Uh, 
And it's partly because of what they are. Bonsai trees uh, are basically grown in a giant sieve. So the little gravel you see there, that's it. There's no soil. You, it grows in volcanic rock. If you don't water it every day, if you go a couple days without watering it, they're dead. Uh, and this tree is over 60 years old. So I feel a lot of burden uh, to take care of this. I feel like it's a legacy. What was said to me when I bought these was, uh, you know, when you buy bonsai trees, you're effectively buying time. Uh, and maybe that was the thing that was so alluring about it. But I think there's also something that I, I connect with in this life that I feel like I have to protect that is similar to the trade desk in the sense that uh, when we started this company, in the, one of the very first slides in the very first deck said that we're building a business for the next 100 years. And uh, I remember pitching the trade desk and talking about price discovery and expressiveness, and somebody who heard the presentation was like, I don't know what he's talking about, but it sounds like it's going to be around for 100 years, so it seems like a good, a good pitch. But I really do believe uh, uh, what was happening before us was rough draft after rough draft. There were so many ad network business models that came and went very quickly. Uh, and we were iterating as an industry. I, I, I built some of them too, built them, threw them away, and started something else. But I really believed that when we got to the trade desk that we were building a final draft, one that would last at least 100 years. So I do look at it now that we're 15 years into a 100-year plan. A a and the things that we've been building for the last 15 years are uh, the foundation for where we're going. Part of the reason why I take the moment to say this right now is I want to talk to you about AI. Uh, but I don't want it at all to be suggested that we're in AI a a because it is trendy, because it is the flavor of the month. It is the most hype technology of the last 10 years. I have not seen hype or momentum around a concept like this since the dot-com phase. But I do believe this is different. It doesn't mean that there aren't things that are overvalued and that people are putting money into things just because it says AI, just like they did when it said dot-com. But there were some really amazing things that came out of that dot-com era, including many of the companies that we're talking about today. But the same thing is happening with AI. There are amazing things happening. AI has been injected into the Trade Desk platform. It will be a part of our foundation for the next 100 years but we are just merely getting started. We started this journey in 2018. You'll remember when we launched Koa, which is our brand, which is, by the way is also a wood, a very hard old wood. The very first surfboards in Hawaii were, uh, were made out of Koa wood. It's very hard, very durable, and long lasting, which is exactly why we chose that name. We loved that metaphor. But we haven't implemented AI perfectly along the way. In fact, during the pandemic, I, I think we made a little bit of a mistake in the sense that we started centralizing too much of our AI into one sort of Uber algorithm. And that can be really difficult to manage when you have as much covariance as in, and as many variables as we do in advertising. By the way, I think the variables in what we do are one of the hardest mathematical problems to solve because you're betting on human emotion. You're betting on human response where you're trying to make an emotional appeal to people. You literally are in the business of connecting with people. So if you're doing that, it is just going to be hard to boil that down just to ones and zeros, which is why we've always said this is a, an issue of pilot and co-pilot. But I just want you to know that your co-pilot has gotten a lot better in the last few years and gotten a lot better today. So one of the concepts that we've tried to inject in this is something that I've never seen embodied more than when I went to this F1 race. As I was sitting there watching them do this a few years ago, it made me think of, of the challenges of, at the time we called distributed algorithms. Let's break down all the different functions and create different groups to work on them, but also recognize that there's different mindsets with all of them. By the way, this is two hours before the race. So uh, this thing is taken apart. Everybody is working on it and getting ready for an amazing race, but fine-tuning very different things. The way they think is very different. The people that are being analytical in the corner are different than those being mechanical in the middle. Just an important concept to realize that what we've been doing is distributing more and more. 
which is why you probably heard us talk less and less about COA before, and you hear us talk more about specific instances of COA around our platform. So we are now distributing AI across our platform in the exact same way. We have AI injected in some fashion in all of these ways. So in predictive clearing, which I'll talk more about, in relevant scoring, in performance prediction, in real-time decisioning, in all the campaign optimization, in budget prioritization, by the way, that's a big one. As somebody who's been trading, you spend way too much time moving budget around. On behalf of you, as somebody who's doing it too, I, it's one of my missions to just make that better for all of us. And then increased resilience, what that means is just when you lose signal, like uh, uh, let's say an Apple mobile identifier, uh, uh, with all the other signal you have, you can make up for it because of the, uh, the AI's ability to manage covariance. And in fact, the rarity of its absence actually is a signal in and of itself that is very difficult to manage if you're using anything other than AI. And then, of course, forecasting, which is one of the most difficult tasks ever in our space because of the amount of covariance and the amount of variables. So your new co-pilot is actually a cousin to ChatGPT. So it is a deep learning model. It is not like ChatGPT in that it is a GPT model or a language-based model, because this is much more mathematical. And also, of course, ChatGPT, uh, uh, it can take three, four, five, six, seven seconds because it's kind of an ask me anything technology. Uh, that's not really what we need inside the trade desk, <laughs> inside our bidder. Uh, uh, and, and thank God that's not what we need because we don't have seven seconds to respond. So while it's several orders of magnitude smaller than ChatGPT, it is several orders of magnitude faster. And one of the things that we did very early at the trade desk is that in order for us to support bid factors, we had to put a lot of pressure on the processor instead of in RAM. Because we basically said in order to, to support real expressiveness, well, we needed to basically do that on the fly because there's way too many permutations to cache. You'll notice that NVIDIA became a trillion dollar company because everybody recognizes essentially the exact same concept which is in order to support that many permutations, you have to basically lean on the processor in real time and not simply on the cache. So as a result of that, COA is now a series of deep neural networks. By the way, the reason it's called deep neural networks is because what you're trying to mimic is effectively the human brain. And the human brain basically takes all these different decisions and different tasks and separates them. Uh, and you separate them recognizing that for every task, there's a different model that you want to run. So we have a different model for all the individual tasks that you saw on the previous slide. But what that nets out to is that every impression is essentially a snowflake. It is uniquely considered. That is the ultimate in expressiveness. It gives us the ultimate power in decisioning. And every bid is a snowflake. And that distributed algos and distributed AI together can essentially take advantage of that, of that covariance and capture the complexity. And then we also can learn from, from new situations, including even the absence of signals as we're looking at those 13 million impressions every single second. So I'm very excited that Predictive Clearing, which is one of the most important systems in our platform, has deep learning models built into it. And it is running today. Our very first deep learning model was launched actually last year. The best place to, to start something that is as advanced or as complicated as AI is to take one of your campaigns that is failing badly and point it at it, because what do you have to lose, right? Let, let's go try it against something that isn't working. So the very first campaign that we pointed our deep learning model of AI against was a performance campaign that was underperforming and we decreased its cost by half. So we doubled its performance in the very first one that we, we, we pointed this system at. So I'm extremely excited about what this represents for the future, and we are merely getting started. So performance has been spectacular, but we are in a state where we are really trying to create distinction between value and price. You have to, at this moment of connected television, where prices, CPMs are higher in CTV than they've ever been. So you have to really be thinking, is it worth it? Not how do I get the cheap, cheapest stuff possible, which that mindset has been plaguing our industry for decades. What is happening right now is a fundamental revaluation of the assets on the internet. And it is largely driven by the presence of identity. By this time next year, 
the majority of CTV impressions will include UID2. This is a game changer for the entire open internet because it will have trickle down effects not just in TV, but in every other channel as well. And that is largely because UID2 has been changing the way that we decision and solving a bunch of problems. I want to just briefly explain how we got here. So for the last 20 years, we've had the cookie syncing problem. We've had the data pricing problem where if you have multiple data elements on something, you pay for it twice, and the sum of all the data elements isn't worth it, but they're all adding value. So how do we price it differently so that it will all work? We've also had the what I call the page five problem where we've asked uh, users to scroll, scroll, scroll. It's not dissimilar from the problems that Amazon had 10 or 15 years ago where the product you really wanted was on page five. And so you had to scroll and you had to look a lot. You had to sift through things you didn't even want. Now, by the way, they're much better at it. How often do you make it to page five today? Almost never. And if you're like me, you're on there all the time. And almost always buying from page one or two. What we've done is we've gotten rid of the scrolling problem. Uh, and then there's also all these changing identifiers, the mobile IDs and cookies going away that has made it so that we've had to respond to that by creating something new. So. Uh, uh, we have made it so that quality is much better than it's ever been. Viewability, metadata on inventory, us creating standards, gold standard, enforcing those standards. And incidentally, there's so much for us to do uh, to continue to improve on that. But I just want to celebrate that at this moment, it's better than it's ever been. We also, in the last year, rolled out fractional pricing and multi-element bidding. People confuse those as being the same. They're two different things. But there could not be a healthy data ecosystem in our space without those two problems being solved. Uh, Relevance-based pricing, so if you're adding relevance in the sense that this data creates users that are 30 times more likely to convert, this data segment creates users that are 10 times more likely to convert. Well, one of those is three times more valuable than the other one. So let's make certain that the price we pay reflects that, in part because we want a vibrant data ecosystem. If we didn't do that, we wouldn't be able to make some of the announcements that we're going to make in a few minutes about participation in the data ecosystem. Uh, and then UID seeds. Uh, so UID2 makes it possible for people to onboard their first party data and, and, and put that to work. It's really difficult to overstate the significance of UID2 in our space. We used to, for the last 20 years, have a needle in the haystack problem. And now we figured out a way to just go buy a box of needles. That's really what we've done to solve uh, uh, the identity and, and cookie syncing problems. So today, as a result, our inventory markets are thriving for the first time. Our data ecosystems are not anemic like they have been for nearly the entire history of the trade desk. And UID2 is connecting the world. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for every advertiser in the world to have an identity strategy. And what I mean by having an identity strategy is that you have a way to connect your data, often in a CRM or in a database that collects a, a, a purchase data, uh, to connect to your marketing efforts. And if you're not in your own four walls, and the bigger you are as an advertiser, the more likely you are to have to walk across campus uh, to make this a reality. Uh, but uh, I, on your, for your benefit, please do it. Because I believe every advertiser, in order to stay competitive, has to have an identity strategy. Equally as important, every content owner needs to have an identity strategy and an authentication strategy. And when I was talking before about how important it is for, uh, for journalism to change, there's not a place where it's more important for them to change than on this. 10 years ago, I was speaking at a conference with almost 1,000 journalists in the room, and I said, the future of your industry depends on your ability to understand programmatic advertising. Uh, and, and of course, we don't need every journalist to understand it, but we need some department of any, every journalistic company in the world to understand programmatic advertising. What they need to know right now is that authentication is what is the single biggest catalyst for repricing everything. Because nearly everything in CTV is on the other side of a login. So the value of CTV is going to continue to, to thrive. Because as we leverage more and more data in CTV, because we can, because you're logged in, and because you can connect to the very same ID that, that they're using in CTV, which is UID, you can use that very same ID to deploy your data in CRM, 
That's how we get that seed that gets applied up here. That's where the magic happens. If you are a, a web-based journalistic publisher that only has 1% of your users logged in, you have to think about how you can connect that. And you'll see us continue to work with you and we'll uh, uh, announce products and partnerships throughout the rest of this year that will help on this, but this is a, an extremely important concept that every content owner I I that can hear me uh, should be working on if you're not already. So I'm very excited to announce today that UID2.com is live. This is easy access to all documents, for, to our SDKs, uh, and when I say ours, I mean the community that is developing UID2. This is an open source project. Uh, uh, there are many companies that are using it beyond ours and using it to interact with each other, and there's even uh, more happening on that today. UID2 development has expanded so that you can actually use UID2, put your data to work without the data itself ever leaving your environment. And our partnerships with companies like Snowflake and Google Cloud and AWS have ensured that this is possible. And Azure is coming soon. But today, UID2 can easily integrate across all channels, whether we're talking about mobile or connected television or the browsing web. And connecting all of those becomes increasingly important, especially as CTV becomes often the kingpin or the top of the funnel. This summer, UID2 will launch as an open currency as well. So I just want to explain what that enables. To date, really, we've limited the use cases of UID uh, to, even though we've created partnerships with all these different companies, and many, many other companies have created partnerships, we've limited its use case to things touching advertising. But it's possible for them to, to use and transact way beyond advertising I think this is going to unlock the potential of UID in companies like Shopify or Salesforce to do things that uh, are not as directly related to advertising, which is going to continue to fuel the power of UID2, but spin that flywheel or that virtuous cycle that makes it so there will be more and more opportunity to put first party data to work. I want to take one minute to talk about EUID. You may know that about two years ago, we made a decision to create a separate instance of UID2. It's basically a different branch of the same code. Uh, and the reason for that is because in Europe, there's a much more complicated uh, set of constituents as well as the rules of GDPR and wanted to make certain that the data never left Europe, uh, which has been a, a, a very important concept. I'm glad we did that years ago. Many of big, big tech have actually been fined or had problems since then for not doing that. EUID is meant to keep the data in Europe and leave the opportunity for it to evolve in slightly different ways. You'll see announcements from us over the summer on some major advances in EUID, but just wanted you to know that we were pedal to the metal on making this a reality across Europe, as identity is just as important there as it is here. I know there are many that have not taken the challenge to try to make GDPR a reality. And I really do believe EUID is the best chance to realize the vision, and I do believe GDPR is a vision, uh, uh, to realize the vision of GDPR, which gives consumers the control that they need in order to own their privacy, including things like right to be forgotten. That's very difficult to do if you don't anchor that off of something so that you can keep track of who was forgetting specific data. And that's why anchoring that off of something as benign as an email address or a phone number becomes very important. Measurement. So for the rest of this, I feel like I get to be a bit more like Oprah, where I just get to give things away. 23 months ago, we talked about a, a few partners. We maybe had three or four logos on a screen at Solomar's launch, where we were launching a measurement marketplace. And not only have we built a robust measurement marketplace, but we've also made it possible for retailers to put their data to work. These are some of the most premier retailers in the world and from all over the world. And this is just on the retail data side where they're putting that to work for targeting. If we're talking about measurement and also targeting, there's so many more. I am so proud of what our team has built. We've added some amazing rock stars to the team since we launched this 23 months ago. And they've done an amazing job. We're going to hear from some of them uh, uh, later today. 
But one of the innovations that we're here to talk about today is a new product called the Retail Sales Index. I mentioned that we can't change the open internet without putting objective measurement into place. The Retail Sales Index is a big part of that. Let me explain what it is. There are a lot of sources of data, as shown in all the logos on the previous slide. If we were to create a, a report where we create a column that says, here's all the things you sold at Target, here's all the things you sold at Walgreens, here's all the things you sold at Albertsons, here's all the things you sold at Dollar General, and we just keep going through and you have a, a, a report that has 114 columns in it, uh, uh, you're not going to want to look at that report. And then if everybody has different methodologies for the way they count, we're back to that dilemma of the open internet has a much higher burden than a walled garden does. So how do we simplify that? We can't hand you all of that complexity. So we created a retail sales index where we're asking some of the biggest retailers in the world to put their data into a single column. And let's also make it possible so that we can connect the measurement to the targeting without any effort from you. So what that does is the retail measurement data is free with a few retail pioneers. So what that means is that you'll get measurement for free for just signing up for the targeting. And so without any action, all you do is say, if it makes financial sense for me to buy it, I will. And then if I buy it, I get to see if I sold any product. This is connecting to end to end without any action required from you other than to have that targeting on. And by the way, what COA Audiences does is it basically runs the lookalike modeling, runs the probability of increased conversion, and makes certain that that's worth the cost. If it is not mathematically obvious that this is worth the cost, we don't buy it. If it is, we buy it on your behalf, and if you do that, you get free measurement from these three retailers, Walgreens, Albertsons, and Dollar General. As I mentioned on the previous slide, I believe these are pioneers in our space. We talk about the advancement of the cause that is the open internet. This would not be possible without the forward thinking and vision of these three companies. So I am just so proud to be their partner. I'm proud for our team for working with them to make this possible. It requires them to do a lot of data and analytics to make certain that their business will thrive because of it. And it's only because of all those things that we fixed on those previous slides that it's possible for us to partner in this way. But what we're talking about is always on easy measurement from the bottom of the funnel to the top of the funnel that gives a degree of objectivity that no walled garden could ever provide. And by doing that, it makes it possible for us to have objective, effective measurement that is, that is more effective than any other way to do it. And that objectivity, once again, becomes our, our strength. So I'm excited to announce that this is in beta today. But wait, there's more. Measurement is a serious issue in our space. And one of the problems is that not all content is created equal. I debated whether to use this photo because I think it's too adorable. Because what we're trying to showcase is that while cat videos are, are, are great and user-generated content is fantastic, it's not the same as premium content. And we need measurement to reflect that. Uh, so I think I should have picked an uglier cat, but, uh, uh, but I wanted you guys to have something nice to look at. So today we're announcing upgrades to a product that we launched a couple of months ago in beta, our TV quality index. We launched it kind of quietly, so many of you may not know about it. But what it does is it pinpoints the value of professionally produced content. A and essentially what we're helping to do is shift budgets from UGC to premium, and then we're showcasing the value of premium. I believe this is absolutely required because what has happened is we've taken a lot of the legacy metrics from traditional television and brought them over into digital. And I, I think that's actually helpful, especially because linear and digital are often uh, uh, analyzed together. But because we also have increased cost in digital and because we have the ability to be much more targeted, we also have to be better at measuring and justifying that incremental cost. So there has to be incremental measurement alongside with it. This is free, by the way. And in CTV, there's often one of the complaints is that there isn't enough signal to optimize to because you're creating awareness. There aren't clicks. There aren't as many interaction opportunities directly with those impressions themselves. So more signal to optimize to makes it much more helpful. So we basically created this metric and then using the data plus testing surveys to make certain that we got all of this right, 
and then correlate that to if the score goes up, what happens to the conversion rate of those that are using it? And basically, for every 10 points of TVQI increase, conversion rates across the board went up by more. So we know the metric is working. Because it's free, there is no reason why everybody shouldn't be using additional signal, especially with this correlation. So I'm extremely excited about this. I think we should have announced it much more loudly when we did a few months ago. But now that, is, uh, that it's GA, I'm very excited to reintroduce many of you to, to TVQI. As we've been talking about, there are these concepts of seeds and relevant score. So again, if you have a relevant score of 10, what that means is that you're 10 times more likely to convert than the general population. So as we have relevant score placed throughout the system, we also need measurement to reflect relevance. So uh, there have been amazing products uh, in television in particular to measure reach. But there haven't been reach measurement products that, one, go beyond television, but also reflect your individual data. So most of the products have been somewhat basic in are you on target of this uh, uh, general demographic versus how on target are you to your seed, to your, to your reach? And so this is quantifying mathematically how similar your marketing audiences are at the top of the funnel to those that you're actually selling products to. How quality is my reach? We contemplated, incidentally, calling this the Omnichannel Quality Reach Index, but we felt that we would perpetuate one of the worst parts of our industry, which is creating the most complicated acronyms in any industry. So we stuck with the three-letter acronym, QRI. Uh, uh, so we stuck with the standard, and we'll continue to perpetuate too many acronyms. As we talk about a change to our, our UX, which is in some ways where the rubber meets the road, these changes will also be available in the API. Over the rest of the summer, you're going to see some pretty dramatic changes to our user experience to orient around the concepts that we've been talking about today. One is what we're calling the shopping cart functionality. And this will come out near the end of the summer. In the top right of every page, whenever you make a decision, we'll show you the impact of that decision on your relevance score, on your expressiveness, on your budgeting, on your forecasting. Because often what happens in our platform is you make changes and then you have to come back in a couple of days to see what effect that had. And so partly because of the benefits of AI, uh, we will be able to forecast what that's going to look like before you ever do anything. And in the top right, you'll be able to make much more informed decisions. One of the reasons why I'm so excited about this is that the single biggest optimization that's made in our platform today is across supply vendor. And I view this in some ways as a tragedy that where we're spending the most amount of time is selecting the supply vendors instead of where is my audience, where can I reach them? We're spending time pruning and protecting the supply path. So we're going to make this a lot better over the next few months as we move into the end of the summer. You'll see a, an upgrade to nearly all of you. Uh, I say nearly all of you because uh, we are going through phases where right now there's a select few that are using the uh, these upgraded features, and then we're iterating as we go so that we can give them to nearly all of you. So I do believe Kokai will feature AdTech's most powerful and transformative UI and UX to date. And it will be built around these concepts. And I just want to lay groundwork so that you understand why we built what we have. There are these 13 million QPS, uh, or queries per second, which basically means ads available every single second across the entire internet. Almost no one is looking at all of those. And when I say no one, I mean we do as, as the trade desk, but an advertiser doesn't because uh, they have set parameters. I only sell shoes in the United States, or at least for this campaign, I only sell them in the United States. Well, that cuts it by more than half. You get rid of uh, considering all the impressions outside the United States. But you do the same thing when you set up frequency caps or brand safety parameters or anything else. But what, what is a very difficult thing for us to do is right-size that consideration set. We want to make it small enough that you're deciding among the impressions that are the most likely to help you. And we want you to tell us, essentially, your hypothesis of where can I find uh, the users that are most likely to buy my product. But we, if you over-restrict it, now you make it impossible for us to decide, especially if you're determined to spend your budget. You say, I'm going to spend this amount of money. Well, if you say, I'm going to spend 10 grand, and you only leave a consideration circle large enough to spend 9 grand, 
we may spend it all following your directions badly. So we would much rather us create consideration circles or consideration set that is large enough to empower robust decisioning and put all these tools to work, while at the same time narrowing that so that we're not uh, uh, waiting for, for learnings by spending money. So for our most sophisticated users, I want to introduce to you the paradigm uh, for this new user experience. We basically have created a programmatic periodic table. And the reason why I think this is the right paradigm and why I'm so excited about this is actually the same reason why the periodic table exists in the natural world. Basically, we took all the building blocks uh, of the entire universe when we put together the periodic table. That's how every chemical compound is created. That's how everything in the world is constructed. And so if you break it down to its most basic elements, then you make it possible to create all sorts of combinations. So I want to explain a little bit why we've created this and why this will be the centerpiece of our new user experience. On the left, you have things that the user controls. And at the, at the top, of course, is the advertiser. And at the right, all the way on the right side, you have COA. So you have the pilot on the left and the co-pilot on the right. And then there's all the structure on the left that sets up the rules, the parameters, the restrictions, what part of the funnel are you after, what are the goals that you're after. But in the middle, you have all of these elements that are assembled together to create campaigns. And those are roughly sorted by weight. And weight, in this case, means how much impact are they likely to have and how frequently are you likely to need to change them in order to have optimal impact. What it does by putting them in this order is gives you a rough guideline of what you should change first. And so by putting things like base bit at the beginning, we make it easy for you to know where to start, which is something that has been really difficult in our space and in our UX to date, because it can be really difficult to know where should I start? What do I do next? Uh, as a user of the platform, I at times have found myself confused as to where to go next. So I'm very excited uh, about the rollout of this product. So this will be the orientation for the rest of it. You'll also notice that on the navigation itself, there is metadata. So how, what percentile is my base bid? OK, I'm right in the middle. OK, great, that's what I want to be. Uh, wh what percentile is my max bid? OK, I'm near the top. Maybe that's the thing I change. If I'm underspending and I see my frequency caps are tighter than usual, then maybe that's the place I want to start. You'll get much more metadata to understand where you can create a new hypothesis and then interact with it yourself or give COA license to help you. There will be guidance on every single tile, as I've mentioned. And then we will have cached reports. So if you're, if you're hands on keyboards, this may be your favorite part of the presentation today, which is that there will be reports, especially the most important ones, waiting for you. Right now, because we have been optimizing for giving you as much insight and data as possible, we have made it so that we have to generate the reports. You have to wait for them. I believe this is one of the single biggest reasons why people don't optimize more than they, uh, they should be optimizing more, and they don't, often because they have to wait for it. As I've seen interns for the Family Foundation, which is maybe a good segue to some of the things that have motivated or inspired all of this, is just that I am in the platform, just like many of you, hands on keyboards, buying media for these, I think, well-deserving causes. I really think all the things we're talking about matter. And I want to just talk about the application for one of them. So uh, the Ruth Cheatham Foundation there in the bottom right is an organization uh, that tailors to kids who have cancer. And we give away scholarships. And when I, I met them, they had only given away 20 scholarships in their, in their organization's history. Uh, this year will be at about 400. And they say this never could have happened if it weren't for the trade desk. And it's in large part because their biggest problem was getting the word out. Finding a very small audience of the 89,000 kids and their families that, uh, that have, uh, are managing cancer at any one time in the United States is difficult because it, 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 it doesn't discriminate by geography or by economic status. Bidding by those variables doesn't help you at all. So finding ways in a HIPAA compliant way to be in places that are more likely to get the word out 
made it possible for us to create awareness about scholarships that these families never would have known another way. When you think about the application of the things we were just talking about, it can be really academic, and we can look at the periodic table and say, oh, that's cool, but when we talk about how it can actually affect lives, how it can make advertising better, how it can make non the nonprofit world better, it's easy to get really passionate about what's possible. Uh, incidentally, yesterday we announced, or I announced, that uh, I'm building a school with Jay Sears. If you know who Jay Sears is, he uh, was the SVP at Rubicon. He builds schools today. There are many people in ad tech that support him. That, uh, in fact, that's been most of the source of him raising money. So I'm excited that before the end of the year, we'll build another school in Nicaragua. And that is, to me, an, another example of what the open internet can do when we come together and when we see success and we get focused on something that is actually about making things better, not just in our ecosystem, but in the world. So I'd like to leave you with just a couple questions. And these are the things that I talk about with, with my team all the time. Samantha, who's gonna come on stage in a little bit, when I offered her uh, the job to be our chief strategy officer and to spearhead unified ID around the world, there was a moment where she said like, ooh, that's a big job. It's a big undertaking and I don't wanna let anybody down. And I kind of flipped it on its head and I said, Samantha, what if we get it right? What if it all works? What if we changed the open internet? And I really believe that's what's possible today. So as a reminder, today we launched a retail sales index with free retail measurement, a UID2 self-service portal that's coming in July, a quality reach index. We launched new tools for open path and supply chain tra transparency. We talked about a new UX that will be out before the end of the summer. We talked about a partner portal. Well, there are 450 integrations that have already been done with more speed and welcome many, many more. Products that went GA today, UID2 with AWS, Google Cloud and Snowflake, our TVQI index upgraded, Galileo upgraded, and then of course OpenPath upgraded. So when we put all of those together and we talk about, in, in my view, the significance of what we could accomplish over the next year or two. If just alone we accomplish what we've set out to in UID2 and OpenPath, we really can change the open internet to be much more effective. That is only possible if we all work together. I cannot thank those of you that are innovating and building to us. Some of you have had to be patient to do that. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your partnership. To our advertisers, this would never exist without you, without the agencies. We would be nothing. The trade desk is nothing without your partnership. And so I, I can't thank you enough for trusting us, for leaning in, giving us feedback, and being there, being our partners, having open dialogues, and, and trusting us to help you navigate this complicated open internet. And I really do believe that this new way of doing things is here to stay. Like that bonsai tree, we're, we've got 100 years. We've got a long, long journey ahead, but you're gonna see a ship product like the way we have today, which is more often, much more frequent. You're gonna see a lot more innovation. It's gonna come more rapidly, more frequently. But I, I think there is an opportunity for us to put our head down, go to work, not forget what we're after, because if, if we can do that, I really think that what's at the top of the hill is something really beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah.